Hello students, uh, this is Dr. Winkler. My full name is Albert Winkler. This is the first lecture of the World War I class. I've taught this class, what, four times at Brigham Young University and a number of times also at Utah Valley University. So I'm going to try to use my limited expertise to give you a better understanding of the war itself. Now, what we're doing right here, let's go to this in the upper right hand part of the screen. See, Winkler's World War I study guide. <clears throat> I don't, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to get all this to you, but I'm going to try to make sure, going to try to make sure that <clears throat> you have access to this. I will use this as your study guide. This is information that you will need. Notice it goes down for quite a number of pages. But as I lecture, I'm going to be using this as a place where you can look for the information. This will help you understand the information I'm presenting to you. Sometimes students ask me, they'll say, oh, Dr. Winkler. I need more notes. I need your lecture notes. Well, I don't have lecture notes. Lecture notes are up here. However, to try to make sure I present the information in a logical manner, I do follow the student study guide, which is this. I don't know how well this is going to appear on the screen when you are playing this back. However, I do recommend that when you play it back, excuse me, you go to full screen mode. That way, rather than having on YouTube a small square, it'll, it'll encompass the entire screen. At that point, I think it would be <clears throat> much more easy for you to see all this information and to follow along. Once again, I hope I can get this to you in complete form so you can print it off and as I'm lecturing, you can come and you can see where I'm at, and then you can write notes either on the page itself or on a notebook or a sheet of paper off to the side. That way you'll get the information you need for examinations. Well, let me talk a little bit about the war. Let me, let me get into this. Uh, we're talking about World War I. Let's ask ourselves an interesting question. Why would we study, why should we study something so disgusting as war? Isn't war disgusting? Boy, I'm going to make a big deal about this throughout the semester. The kinds of human suffering involved, the kind of pain, the kind of destruction. Well, why would we discover, discuss anything that that's awful? When I was at Utah State, <clears throat> got my bachelor's degree there and my, and my first master's degree there. When the professors got up, it was a Utah history course of all things. Isn't that interesting? And he said, got up and says, we shouldn't study war. No, nah, we shouldn't study war. The only thing important about a war is actually the number, the peace agreement. Now, depending on which time you're talking about early days of history, sometimes you're talking about a few thousand people. The first census, 1850, not a lot of people here. Even 1860, 70, and 80, not a lot of people here. However, I'm the wise in the higher class. I didn't say anything. I thought of this. But my goodness. According to the various estimates, you read 60 million, 65 million, 70 million men were actually participating in this war. If you look at the numbers, would you not say that the human experience, what those men went through, makes the entire scope of Utah history almost insignificant? It's, it's not really there. We shouldn't look at that experience? No, I think we should. As you know, when you have your master's thesis, you have what you call the defense of thesis. In other words, you, you, you hand this out to your committee, they read through it, and they give you a hard time, and then they pass you. Nonetheless, I remember when I was defending my thesis, the professors got after me. You see, this is the early 1970s. The Vietnam War isn't over with yet. 
I'm sure you're familiar with the history of the Vietnam War, student protests, people upset, and the nation's divided in many ways over the nature of the war should we continue. And after a while, the hawks lose out and the, and the doves are screaming bloody murder, those kind of things. You're aware of all of that. I happened to do a master's thesis on a military topic. And the professors got after me. You're pro-war. You glorify in war, don't you? That's what you like. You see, they look at people who are interested in war somehow as those who are adventurous and glorify war, glorify pain. Well, I do not glorify war. And I do not glorify pain. I'm going to say a lot of negative things about war. You're going to hear my opinion on a lot of topics throughout this semester. But I'm not a pacifist. I believe there are very good reasons to go to war at various times. No matter how painful, there's times when it has to be done. My question, of course, is what are your justifications? And uh, is there what we call a just war? And I'm going to make arguments throughout this semester that the necessity of fighting the First World War is somewhat questionable. Was it really a necessary war that had to be fought? We will address that as we go along. However, I haven't answered the question, have I? Why study something so disgusting as war? A World War I veteran, a very important military historian, <clears throat> he wrote extensively about the nature of war, the kinds of things that happen in war. Uh, Basil Littlehart, an Englishman, wrote about World War I. He wrote, wrote about World War II. Uh, he has been very well received as a historian as, as, and as a military theorist. And here's a quote from him which I would like to present for your interest. If you wish for peace, understand war. Now, that's a very interesting quote. If you wish for peace, understand war. You see, a lot of times people go into war because they think it's an adventure, it's a game. And, and to justify my nation, and, and, it, and the good guys always win. None of that's true. It's not a venture. It's not a game. Human suffering is something that you really is not fun. And the extent, the amount of human suffering involved in the First World War should not be downplayed. When you go into war not knowing what it's like, not knowing the kinds of things it's going to do to you, to your family, your society, then you're much more likely to go into war. You see, I agree with Basil Littlehart. We don't study war because we like it. We study war to prevent it. I, I, liked, I ran across this analogy in a book once, talking about shall we study war, shall we not study war. The author was essentially saying, are doctors in favor of disease? I would say that the doctors are not in favor of disease. I'm going to say very strongly that doctors are trying to prevent disease. But they do study disease, don't they? Don't they study disease to learn how to prevent it? To learn how to cure people that are inflicted with it? Yes. I did come back one of the few times I've ever handled a conversation properly. When my professors at Utah State University got after me, about studying war. I did come up with this. I'm not in favor of war. We study war to understand it. We study war to prevent it, to make sure that you will not go to war unless there's a very good reason to do so. Well, let's look at the names of the war. I don't think this is confusing in any real sense. However, depending on the books you're reading, depending on the time frame when the books were being written, you do have a tendency to see it called by different names. Before we had two of them, before we started counting wars, World War I and World War II, then they, it was called, not always, but often the World War. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very good statement. Obviously, it's on a huge scale, and numerous nations are involved, which we'll be discussing in just a few minutes. World War, later on, we start counting them. You name the other war, the World War. So you got to differ differentiate them, World War I and World War II. 
you can turn that around and call it the First World War. Sure, that's fine. Uh, this is a parlance that actually the British use a lot, and that is the Great War. So it is a great war, the Great War, sure. Are there other great wars? Well, World War II would be a good example. But when you hear the, hear, you're reading British sources, hear the British talk about this, and they say the Great War, you know they're talking about World War I. Actually, Americans usually call it World War I and the First World War. Now, this is, this is war. This is awful. I've been, I've been reading a lot, studying World War I since I was in junior high school. <clears throat> Being an old man, that goes way, way back, many decades. <clears throat> I don't know why I can never let this go, because as I read, and I've read many scores of books, I am continually shocked and offended by what I'm reading. If you are not shocked and offended by the kind of information you receive in this class, if you're not shocked and offended by the readings I'm asking you to read. I, I, I'm asking you to read, should I ask you to read other books that are more shocking? If you're not shocked and offended, I'm not doing my job. Because I'm not adequately representing the reality of what went on. So this is not a feel-good class. It's not a class where everything comes up roses and everything turns out right. No, that's not that at all. It's a dirty, filthy, stinking war. And I'm still shocked. And I'm still offended by it. In a, in a way of talking about the importance of the World War, we do have a tendency to think in terms of progress. <clears throat> you see, can we say, though there are many problems, social problems, political problems, there's a few relatively small wars in the 19th century, the 1800s in Europe. But overall, this is an area where a lot of people are thinking in terms of progress. We, 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 are, we are doing very good things. Men have gotten the right to vote almost everywhere by the early 20th century. Uh, I, I would call that enormously important. When we talk about women in the First World War later on, I'll point out that women got the right to vote largely because of the First World War. We'll address that later. But our institutions are good. You see, we're industrializing. Oh, my goodness. The quality of life. Now, I'm not saying everybody in society benefits the same way from progress, from economics, from industrialization. There are some groups, like the rich get rich. Well, we could argue, and the Marxists like to argue this, well, the rich get rich and the poor get poor. There's something to that, but it's not quite correct. As we look at what's happening through the social classes, because of industrialization, yeah, there are people that are doing very well. The workers down here, well, they're not, they're, shall we say, they're not progressing as much as the upper classes are. But to say they're suffering worse is probably not true. They're actually benefiting as well. So it's kind of like a paradigm shift. But even though we have critics of the economy, critics of society, can we say overall most people are, are benefiting? Yeah, we can, we can make that observation. How about our forms of government? In the 19th century, you know, France becomes one of the most advanced republics anywhere in the world. Even places like backward Germany has an important part of it. They call it the Reichstag, where, they, where you, the Kaiser does have a lot of power, but we now have a representative government, which is really quite effective. Not always, but usually it has some impact what's going on. Britain in the 19th century still has a king. However, actually Victoria is the queen in the 19th century for most of it. It has a queen. She has no power. She, she's just literally a showpiece, shall we say. So who has power in Britain? Parliament does, a representative government. Even backward Russia starting in 1905, had what we call the Duma. It has very little power. It's kind of a debating society because the Tsar won't give it any power. 
but it does exist. Can we say even backward Russia is moving this direction? Is there reason for optimism? Sure there is. Things are getting better. Society is getting better. Quality of life is getting better. Freer people. We're traveling around. Everything's great. Or becoming great, becoming better. Uh, but optimism goes to pessimism. When you start stacking up huge numbers of bodies and the various battlefields. So there are these soul searching questions that many people in society begin to ask themselves. <clears throat> One of which is we face our own demons. Well, is there something in our institutions? Is there something in our society? Is there something in our psyche that's quite negative? Do we have to address these things? To keep them from getting out of hand, a lot of a lot of people say we've got to have a, go through a gut wrenching experience. We've got to re-examine virtually everything we are and our institutions. We say this goes back to the idea of pessimism. We are going to be pessimistic. Suddenly, we've got to figure out how to fix our problems. Not that we're in such good shape. Maybe if you believe in optimism, <clears throat> you're much less likely to face potential problems. If you believe in pessimism, then maybe you believe that we should look more carefully and, and get things fixed. Got a bad joke for you. What's the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? A pessimist is better informed. There might be something to that. We face our own demons. What are we? <clears throat> what are we as human beings? There's a much asked question. It's, it's really going to be asked not in more than one scenario and more than uh, over time. Not only are people going to be very, very shocked because of the First World War, they're going to be at least equally, if not heavily more shocked by the Second World War. <clears throat> in doing that, we ask a question. Are people inherently evil? Rather than assuming people are inherently good, people, the, we see people arguing very strongly that we're all natural killers. We want to get out there and just tear people apart. That's all we are. We're competitors. We're mean by nature. Well, the evidence is quite heavy on the side of brutality because we see it both in the First and Second World War. <clears throat> I, I'm not prepared to dismiss all the arguments because a lot of people do bad things. But I am going to make an, make an argument that people rarely, there are bad people, there rarely actually have people out there that are doing thing, bad things because they want to. Sometimes they're put in a situation forced by their system, forced by the military, forced by the government to do things they would, nor they would not do under any other circumstances. I don't think there's any question people can be manipulated in doing bad things, but does that make us inherently evil? That if we actually had a choice in what we did, we might choose something else. I don't think people are inherently evil. Remember, I'm the optimist. I don't believe people are inherently evil. I think people are inherently kind and benevolent. I think people are inherently cooperators. <clears throat> uh, we do make arguments. You know, we get where we're at because we compete. Capitalism or competing industries that make it better for everybody. I'm not denying capitalism. But I am going to say, as you look at the human being, I'm going to say we look and what we see are people like people. We like getting along with each other. Our industry does have a competitive aspect involved. But if you're going to be producing better goods and services, you better be cooperators. You better get along. The vast majority of people, I think, are kind and good. It is the institutions that can cause people to do bad things. Now, you can debate that in your philosophy classes, in your psychology classes. But initially, this is where I stand. However, in saying that people are good, I'm going to have to say we do need to examine our institutions to see how we can, shall we say, subvert people in doing things that they would not normally do. Well, modern war. This is a modern war. Why do we call it a modern war? Use its technology. The more technically advanced you are, sometimes we say that's more modern. You see, technology is changing for, for centuries and millennia. 
by our standards, very slowly. But when we get industrialization, now we can have killing a virtually unindustrial level because we have mechanisms, we have modern devices that allow killing and combat efficiency to be ever so much more effective. Modern war, yeah. Some people want to go back to the American Civil War and say, oh, first modern war, well, trains are involved. But if you compare the technology in the First World War, it is significantly different. So I'm going to say the first large modern war dictated by technology is the First World War. Well, let me put a caveat on that. The Russo-Japanese War in 1905, well, there's technology involved there as well. A relatively minor affair compared to the First World War. However, can we say on a, such a grand scale, the first time we actually see a lot of technology, this advanced technology. <clears throat> Talk more about weaponry in just a little while. <clears throat> Total War. Total War means, can we come down here a little bit and give you a little better explanation? Total War means that you make war on the totality of your enemy, including the home front. It's not just the man over there who is technically my enemy because my government says it's my enemy. You technically have that man over there and you take him out, you win the war. That's true. But if you have a support system, the people writing him letters from home, if you have people in industry uh, giving him the goods and services he needs from weaponry to food to uniforms, whatever this man needs to continue the fight, if you can damage that which is done at the home front to help that man in the trenches, you are doing some damage to the enemy's war machine. The war machine is not just the men in uniform. We are making war against the totality of our enemy society. Obvious examples of this is the blockade. When Britain puts a blockade on Germany, will not allow food, will not allow fertilizers, almost anything coming into Germany. And obviously, when the German submarine campaign tries, but does not succeed, to starve out Britain in sinking very often civilian vessels, we can see another aspect of total war. This does happen in the First World War. We call it strategic bombing. We actually use combat aircraft, heavy bombers, uh, flying over enemy military areas, naval areas, and also civilian centers and dropping bombs. Compared to the Second World War, this is really quite minor. But we can say that this is a beginning of this kind of things that's going to really explode in the Second World War. So these are examples of a fighting against the totality of the enemy including the home front. One thing I want to point out, and we'll be t talking about all this, of course, is once started, what has, that war has its own momentum and logic right here. War, once started, war has its own momentum and logic. We do have a tendency to start a war saying, oh, we are all helped up and ready to go and our men are trained. The nation is behind us. And then you get engaged in war. Sometimes you send men out early in a war and you find heavy casualties. And people say, we've got to justify the sacrifice. So rather than saying, well, it's kind of a bad idea. No, 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 no. We're willing to sacrifice more. We're willing to draft more men. We're willing to take more material to the front to justify that which has gone on before. You see, you already dictate that, but the mentality comes up when you start having a war. Of course, after a while, we call it war weariness. Sometimes it sets in. And if it goes on for years, World War I does. We do see aspects of enthusiasm early in the war. Aspects of taking casualties. Now we have to justify what we've done. This sacrifice shall not be in vain. So we've got to do more. And then after a while, if that doesn't work, then people say, let's just get this stinking thing over with. You see, it has its own mentality. And it's not always dictated by the government. Excuse me, I got a phone call. <clears throat> Probably a telemarketer. We'll see what happens here. Hello. 
She's in bed. Um, uh, what's that? She's aware of her appointment tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. I wonder if people really believe <laughs> that people are awake before 8.30 in the morning to take your phone call. I'm a nighthawk. I can't sleep with beans. So the fact that I'm awake doesn't really uh, make much difference. But my wife's smarter than I am. She's asleep and good for her. Help she sleeps till noon. Any event, let's go back here. Can you say war shapes the modern world? Yes, it does. This war starts to shape the modern world? Yes, it does. I'm arguing very strongly for that. How many nations are actually involved in the war? They're actually involved in a declaration of war. You end up with about 27. Whoa. Uh, there are nations involved in war in Europe, of course. There are nations involved in war in the Middle East, Turkey. There are nations involved in the Western Hemisphere, the United States, Canada, and several Latin American countries. There are nations at war in the Pacific, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, for example. So, and we call the world war, yes, there's global aspects to it. The heaviest fighting, no doubt about this, had all in Europe, but it's fought in various uh, places, including other continents. Okay, war shapes the modern world, yes. 27 nations at war, yes. <clears throat> Not all these nations, like in Latin America, actually send combat troops to the Western Front. But the declaration of war at least helps them when they're trying to get along with the United States. So there's political ramifications. Others affected? Wow, sure there are. Neutrals, even though Sweden, Switzerland, Norway, Denmark, Spain, are not involved in the war as far as declaring war is concerned. But their economies, their society, the selling of goods and services to the belligerents, the attempt to feed people behind German lines. All of this is part of what these people are doing. Can we say, in a broad sense, the people most heavily involved are the ones at war, but also other nations are affected by the war itself. And when I talk about the blockade, I'm also going to argue, while Britain is trying to starve Germany into submission, they do so not just by blockading Germany, but blockading other neutral powers, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Spain, as well, to try to keep them from trading with the Germans. So their effect as well. <clears throat> the 20th century starts in 1914? Yeah. Sure, the 20th century starts in 1914. It's interesting, modern historians never seem to start a century on the year. We usually say the 16th century starts in 1517 with the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. We say the 17th century starts in 1618 with the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. The 18th century starts in 1715 with the death of Louis XIV. The 19th century starts in 1815 because of the end of the Napoleonic Wars. And the 20th century starts in 1914 with the beginning of the First World War. These are signal events in history that tend to, to set up the tenor of the rest of the century. So the violent century sometimes, because we have wars, we have genocides, and not just in Europe, in many places of the world. <clears throat> Another question, philosophical question I'd like to address. Does World War I make World War II more likely? Another way to ask that is, are, are they the same war? Some historians say they are the same war, and they want to call them the Second Thirty Years' War. Well, um, I'm not really on board on this. 
I'm, I'm not sure that they're the, they're the uh, same war. Some people say, well, it's just round two. <clears throat> you have an armistice running, what, 21 years between 1918 and 1939, and then you go at it again. The same people being involved. Well, on the same sides. Well, that's not true. Remember, Italy is on the Allied side, British and the French, in the First World War, but on the German side in World War II. Doesn't quite fit. Romania is on the Allied side, on Britain's side, in the First World War, but Romania is on the German side in World War II. Poland didn't even exist in 1914, and it's involved in World War, <clears throat> excuse me, World War II. Russia, <clears throat> excuse me, the Soviet Union does have a tendency to be another definition of problem because starting in the Second World War in 1939-1941, they are now like Germany. Now, after 1941, of course, when Germany invades, they are an enemy of Germany. See, they play both sides. I'm not going to say, therefore, that, that it lines up exactly the way it was before. No, quite frankly, it's different. If we hadn't had a World War I, would we had a World War II? No, no, of course not. But let's do another analogy. Let's go back to the American Revolution. American Revolution, as you know, 1775-1783. A few years later, War of 1812, 1812 to 1814. We have another round of war. The Americans are fighting against the British in the Revolution. The Americans are fighting against the British also in the War of 1812. Does that make them the same war? Now, obviously, if there had not been a, a American Revolution and the United States had not gained its independence, then there would not have been a nation to go to war in 1812. Are they the same war? I don't think so. However, if there had not been a revolution, there wouldn't have been a war of 1812. There'd been nobody to fight. It, it, this is something that bothered me for many, many years. You see, in 1918, you end the First World War. 21 years later, you're going to go back and do it again. I always, this always drove me nuts. How on earth could that be possible? The men who fought in the trenches in 1918, they haven't forgotten. Do they really want to do it again? Some people say they did. I don't see really any evidence of this. In some of the areas where, you, where the draft goes very deep during the Second World War, like Austria and Germany, guess what? You were a young teenage, you were in your late teens in 1918, maybe in your early 20s. 20 years later, you're, you're just approaching middle age. You might have been a private back then, you're going to be a sergeant now. They're going to draft you and put you back in the military. You're going to get to do it again. Do you want to do it again? These men haven't forgotten. I think it's a decision by governments, like Adolf Hitler, that have a tendency to bring us back into war in the Second World War. I'm sorry. Yes, there would not have been a World War II without a World War I. I just do not buy in that they're the same war. Yes, the people that are upset. Yes, the people, the government leaders are upset, not the men in the trenches. They, they want peace. They want, shall we say, a peace dividend. They want to have the opportunity of living out their lives without going through this again. For very unfortunately for many of these men, they're going to have to do it again. Same war, Second Thirty Years' War. Let me be really silly, okay? <clears throat> Do we want to say that the Napoleonic Wars, standing in 1815, is the same war as World War I? The only difference is it's, it has a 99 years of peace in between. Like, this is the second hundred years war. You see, when you start playing with those arguments, I think it does get to be a little bit too much. In this case, I think they're different wars. I firmly believe... And very unfortunately, if Adolf Hitler had been killed in the First World War, he very nearly was, that there would not have been a World War II. However, in talking about the First World War starting the 20th century, let's ask another question. Does World War I make Hitler? Does World War I make 
Mussolini? Does World War I make Stalin? And has World War I caused the Great Depression? I know I'm a little bit beyond the scope of this course, but let me at least take a look at this. Can we say the Great Depression does to stabilize what's going on economically in the world? Can we say that when economies are destabilized, in other words, high unemployment, um, productivity of the nation has gone way down, that there is a tendency for totalitarian governments like Germany coming to the fore and starting to dictate power because there's, an ex there's a desperation in the economy and in society. I really want to ar argue that without the Great Depression, the, the Nazis would have never come to power in Germany. If I am correct in that analysis, and I think I can make a good case for that, if I'm correct in my analysis, then maybe the Great Depression actually allows Hitler to come to power. And of course, Hitler is going to start the Second World War. Before the First World War, we do have a tendency to see that in the various economies of the world, remember, largely industrialists go along with Adam Smith, capitalism, where it's called let alone laissez-faire, where you allow the economy to flow. And you're familiar with all these economic theories. I don't need to repeat them. But who actually looks after the economies of various countries before the First World War? There's economic upturns and downturns before the First World War. There are sometimes the bankers talk to other bankers. They get involved and say, look, there's a problem in the economy. It's going bad. We need to get together. We as ourselves, as civilians, get in there and let's do what we have to do to manipulate the economy. That's commonly done. Remember, laissez-faire, the government largely keeps out of the economic upturns and downturns. However, in the First World War, the free market economy is not going to work very well for the simple reason that you have to have certain things produced by industry. Uniforms, weaponry, for example. So the government's getting involved in a very real way. Let's get in, let's manipulate the economy, let's put the money where it needs to be to get what we need out of the economy. When the war is over in 1918, it's not really retreating back to normal. You don't really go back and say, well, it's, government walks away again. No, the government does become involved. Now, the economists in the government are very well-meaning, but quite frankly, they're lacking experience. And they try to moderate what's happening. And the price of stocks go up in the United States, for example. Uh, stock inflation, people go, oh, this is getting out of hand. Well, how can we turn the stock market down? We can cut the monetary supply. When you cut the monetary supply, the economy follows the monetary supply. I'm going to boldly go on a limb here because there are a lot of studies done about the cause of the Great Depression. There are a number of theories. One I've already mentioned, the monetary supply. Another one I'm going to mention is the gold standard, staying on the gold standard. You know, taking wrong actions at the wrong time does become a very big factor in the Great Depression. If there is a factor of government, malfeasance is the wrong word, government inexperience in causing worse things to happen because of doing, shall we say, making wrong decisions, then we can say maybe World War I by influencing governments staying in the economy, did help lead to the Great Depression, which clearly helped Hitler. Now, Mussolini had come to power right after the First World War in Italy. And one of the reasons for this is a, a, the economic disaster following the First World War. As I will discuss later, Italy does not have the industrial base to really become heavily involved in this war. So he's taken advantage of an economic situation shortly after. Stalin, well, one of the reasons why we have the Soviet regime come to power in the Soviet Union is because the First World War was a disaster for Russia. There are economic and social 
forces at work before the First World War. But they make World War One makes everything much worse in, in, in the Soviet Union. I shouldn't call it that. They're not Soviet Union yet. I should call them Russia. Makes it worse in Russia. And making it worse in Russia, well, then you have the opportunity for a few very unscrupulous people. We call them the Bolsheviks, Lenin and later Stalin, coming to ahead, coming to the uh, leadership. See, I'm making a, a case, am I not here, that World War I does help make Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin. Once again, arguing that World War I really does start this terrible era of modern war. And a starting the violent century. Another question which we'll be discussing, does the war create modern genocide and lead to the Holocaust? One of the earliest examples of what we call modern genocide. Modern genocide, is that 20th century? See, genocide's been going on for a very long period of time, unfortunately. If we want to go back in the, well, we can go back for centuries. We want to go back in the last part of the 19th century and into the 20th century. We do see colonial empires, who are, and sometimes the people taking over the colonies aren't nice people. They murder people. They, they shoot people down with machine guns. They take them out with rapid fire artillery. When they administer them, sometimes they do so in a very, very brutal manner. In 1907, in German Southwest Africa, you and I now call it Namibia, uh, the Germans decided to exterminate the Herero people. Depending on which book you want to read, there's 80,000, 100,000, 120,000 Hereros. When it's through, about th in about three years, there's about 20,000 of them left. That's genocide. That's not in Europe. It's colonial. But it is the 20th century, is it not? Um, the one we usually associate with the First World War is the Armenian Genocide, which started in 1915. Armenia happened to be in Turkey. Some people say, ah, this, this is the point at which. This is the point at which we start modern genocide. Well, yeah. Uh, if you start killing people in Turkey, because they, by Muslims, because they are Christians. Does this lead to the Holocaust, which is the destruction of Jews in, Jews in Germany and other places in Europe, starting in the 1930s and going through 1945? Does this, is, is World War I unleash this? This is not a Holocaust course. The hatred of Jews is very, very old. It goes back many, many centuries. I think it's very unfortunate there were any examples at all during the First World War of genocide. But I'm not sure that that example did lead to the Holocaust of the Jews in 1930s and 40s. However, when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, he's essentially telling his troops to be brutal. He says, remember this, no one remembers the Armenian Genocide. It's like you can do things and get away with it. I'm sorry, I don't think the Holocaust is the same thing, but setting a tenor of brutality and violence certainly doesn't do anybody any favors. Our understanding of the First World War, history as propaganda. How do we use history? How do we use history in our societies? How do we teach? What's the point? Now, a lot, when I was in high school, way long time ago, when I was in high school, they were, they, I remember in American history class my junior year in high school, the professor's professor, the teacher was saying that what the reason why we're taking this class is to make you patriots, to make you appreciate how wonderful your country is. Well, maybe that is the purpose of it. But when we're looking at history as a tool for political and social ends, is there a tendency for us to be very selective in the kind of information that 
that we're given. If there's something negative about our experience, going back to my high school history class, I knew there was slavery. I knew there was slavery in the South. I knew they had killed Indians. I knew they killed Indians in the American West. I'm a Utah. Some of this even happened within the state in which I live. But do you talk about that in a history class? And maybe another history instructor would have done it a little bit differently. A discussion of slavery? Uh, no, I'm sorry. We, we really didn't see that. And a discussion of destruction of the Native peoples? We really didn't see that either. Let's downplay things that maybe should have been done differently. We should downplay things that are a little embarrassing. And play up those things which are really quite nice. And there's very, a lot of very nice things about American history. Anyway, if you're teaching history with an end in mind, not just trying to understand history better, but trying to make a certain impact on society, then we're trying to create a national ethos, are we not? As Americans, we believe in this manner. We think these certain things. Other nations, Mexico, for example, our neighbors down south, uh, they might look at the American experience a little differently and look at uh, the war with Mexico, 1846 to 48, as uh, aggression against their nation. Well, most Americans kind of forget that. It does depend literally on what, on what we're trying to do with history. This has gone a little bit more broadly than, than it has in some other respects. Because the question used to the atomic bomb in World War II become politicized. It actually depends a lot on your political spectrum. People who have not studied the issues, people that are not historians, tend to line up on, 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 on different camps. One of the reasons why I find this amusing is that if you're on the right or on the left, you do have a tendency to believe in a certain manner about the necessity of the bomb. One of the things I find interesting about this is it's changed over time. We've had a flip-flop. Initially, the liberals, I'm talking about Harry Truman, who ordered the attack, said that it was necessary. While the conservatives, former President Herbert Hoover and soon-to-be President Dwight Eisenhower, thought it was unnecessary. But now the reverse is true. The tendency of the liberals to believe that it was not necessary the tendency, excuse me, liberals believe it's not necessary. I said that right. And the conservatives believe it was necessary. See, it's, we've got a flip-flop here. This is not a World War II class. I'm certainly not going to get, get a discussion of this. Uh, I've tried to follow the debates over the decades, and I can tell you I've been over the map on this, necessity or, or lack thereof, that kind of thing. But I am going to say that there are times when we do see political ramifications on historical event. I would largely say, if you want to argue right or left, you probably shouldn't use history to justify it. I would argue perhaps you should let the historians argue about historical issues and let politicians argue about politics. Now, it has been my experience, I've been teaching for, whoa, you realize it's 40 years now? Goodness gracious. That's a long time. I've enjoyed it. There have been semesters where I've taught eight different classes. That's my personal best. Many other semesters I've taught six. I've done a lot of teaching. One thing I have noticed is that the quality of my students has always been very high. I'm very impressed with your ability. I'm very impressed with your ability to think things through and come up with good questions and good conclusions. That's one of the things that disappoints me uh, about having to teach online is that I cannot gain from your knowledge. However, of all the students, it seemed to seem, I seem to see this, that the students who are interested in military history tend to be extremely well informed. They have read many books on this already. So many interpretations. This is a bad joke, I'll tell you anyway. I read one book and I understand. I read two books and I get confused. Because now I've got two opinions to deal with. This is facetious. I'm being very silly in saying this. If you want to try to understand things, it's very, very helpful to read large numbers of books and articles dealing with the topic. 
Now, I'm going to make personal statements, my opinion, on a lot of issues here. And that's going to, and you people who read or, or emphasize different works will go, hey, teacher, I've heard it differently. And, and I'm sure you have. Quite frankly, in almost all cases, I've heard it differently as well. I can't say everything I have read or heard or thought or seen debated. I can't do that. I'm trying to get what I consider to be the best information. Can we say the most important aspect, the most things I'm talking about? I'm not going to tell you I have all the answers. I am going to tell you the next time I read another book, I might come up with a different interpretation. I might not believe what I'm telling you a year from now or five years from now. I'm asking you, however, in your knowledge, and you, you do have good knowledge, and I'm sure you have vast knowledge, to consider the kinds of things I'm saying. If what I'm saying has merit, and I hope most of what I say will have merit, if what I'm, if what I'm saying has merit, please use it to understand better from the other information you're given. If I say things, you say, oh my goodness, that does not have merit, ignore it and go on. But please become engaged. Read widely. Read as much as you can. There's going to be many times when I'm going to hit controversial issues. Perhaps the most important of which will be the war guilt, and who's responsible for starting this mess. And I'm going to try to argue some of the, try to give you an understanding of the various theories and to see which you think might have merit. So there's going to be controversies involved. Once again, the most important thing is that you take what information you have here. If you can make it usable, use it. If, you, if not, do get other information. Well, let me talk about something else which I like, want to address in our understanding of the course and understanding of the lecture. This is called historical determinism. Some people think that the best way to understand history is to look at it solely from the standpoint of the people that were involved. You see, here's an event in history. This is what happened. And I live out here in the future in almost in virtually all cases. So I come back and try to understand it in the basis of what's happened next and my perspective. According to some historians, this is backwards. You don't understand history going forward. You understand history going up to that point. So you take the decisions, the ideas that people had, giving them absolutely every credit for what they were doing. And then you come up with that and you understand because you're understanding on the basis of them. Clearly that has merit. But that's a little bit like saying that which happened had to happen. That which happened, happened simply because nothing else could have happened. That's my trouble with historical determinism. I do not buy that. I think we have a choice. I ask in a question. Is everything determined? I don't think so. Do we have a choice? Now, in my entire life, I make all kinds of decisions. I make all kinds of decisions all the time. I mean, literally, literally from the time I'm cognizant in the morning until I go to bed at night. I am making decisions. At least I think I am. You see, there's all kinds of historical forces behind me. There's all, all kinds of considerations behind me. I, I have a culture. I have a background. I have biases. All these kind of things. But I still think that when I had breakfast this morning, I had a choice between, between using steel ground oats. Very good. That's what I have for breakfast. And also rolled oats or cracked wheat. I still think I had that choice. But wait a minute, all these ideas are, are forcing me into, a, into something that I had to do. No, I just decided to have wheat. Actually, I decided to have, have steel ground oats this morning. If we were meeting on campus, I would, I would say, well, I drove up to campus and I saw more than one parking space. And I made a decision to park in the one I parked in. Could I have chose something else? Yes. Yes, I could have. Something else, when we talk about historical determinism, 
it's like people can't make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. As I'm lecturing, I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to choose the right word. I'm trying to keep from mispronouncing words. And I'm trying to be logically correct. I'm thinking things through. Are there times I'm going to mispronounce words? Absolutely. It's not, not that I want to do that. <clears throat> will there be times I'm a little logically on thin ice, perhaps as well. You see, I think I have a choice. I think I have a choice in my life. I think I have a choice, and I think historical characters have a choice. And I think if I can make a mistake, I can do some, something wrong. I can speed and get a, 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 a ticket from, a, from speeding too much. All those kinds of things I can do. And in looking back in the course of my life, there are certain things I have done, which I really wish I hadn't done, or wish I had done differently. If I can make a choice, if I can make a decision, if I can do something wrong, is it possible that historical characters can make decisions and make erroneous decisions as well? Even on the basis of their own examination of themselves. Maybe later in life, say, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Yes, I think this is true of us and I think it's true of them. This is a long way of saying, I don't think we ought to let people off the hook say, oh, that's just the way it was. That's just the way it was. Well, nothing to do about it. History, ha history has value on numerous levels, one of which is, can we look at history and say, oh, by the way, these people, I'm going to say this happened in some cases, these people went to war for the wrong reasons. I'm going to say some people went to the war perhaps when they had other alternatives. At least I'm going to imply that. Maybe as we look at this, we're going to say, wait a minute, maybe we can learn something from the kind of decisions they made. Maybe that could help us make better decisions later on. Let's talk widely in history, okay? We have the First World War. We talk about the build up when we're actually going to go to war. Make, make that decision. The various nations of Europe look at what they consider to be their vital interests. And looking at what they consider to be their vital, vital interests, we are going to say that if we consider that to be threatened, that is a justification to go to war. At the end of the First World War and later on, sometimes people are going to say, are, were those are really our vital interests? Maybe those were interests that were not as important as we made them out to be. And maybe rather than saying, you cross that line, my golly, I'm calling out the troops. Maybe there's an idea of now we'll back off, crud. Who cares, right? So at the end of the first world, at the beginning of the First World War, we find a, a bunch of tough nuts. Let's not bend. However, at the beginning of the Second World War, <clears throat> late 1930s, we call this the era of appeasement, when Britain and France are deciding, well, I don't want another war. Let's let's back off. If Hitler wants the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia, let him have it, if that will bring peace. We're willing to bend. Did they learn a lesson? Yes, they did. They're using a historical example, 1914, and taking it up to 1938 and trying to make a different decision. With all deference to what these people were trying to do, they were probably wrong in 1914 and probably wrong in 1938 as well. Being tough when you maybe you should have backed off, backing off when you probably should have been tough. Let's take it after 1945 and go into the Cold War. Now we're doing tough again. The Berlin Crisis, 1961. John Kennedy is saying, you, we, these are vital interests. If the Soviet Union crosses these various boundaries, we will meet you with force. Is that the right thing to do? Well, it seemed to work. Because we didn't have a World War III. I'm very, very, very pleased to say that. But once again, can we use historical events to help us make better decisions? I think we can. They're not always better, but sometimes they do help us. History as a political weapon. All right. I talked about trying to create a national ethos. And let's take a look at numbers. Numbers, numbers. How many men, and I've already mentioned that, depending on which book you want to read, they say 60 million men, 65 million men, 70 million men were actually involved in the 
in the military of various nations during the First World War. Uh, a variance of 10 million men, that's, that's, a, that's a big variance. Now, that's not terribly important, I don't think. But how about casualties? Can that be more politically motivated? Do government's, government's numbers are often questioned. There's the official line. How many men were killed? How many men were maimed? How many men were wounded? Why would governments maybe want to say that the numbers are different than they actually were? Sometimes you want to use, like using history, as something to create a national ethos. How about also using numbers of casualties to create a national ideology? To say our nation did, did right by what we did. If we, can per, if we can perhaps downplay the cost, it makes our government and our decisions look better. So maybe next time our government will look better and people will be able to trust more often the decisions made by the government. I'm not really sure what to make of some of these things that I have noticed. But let me put, push, put this out. As military historians, I'm sure you're aware of numbers that get pushed out all the time. Let's look at the United States. That's close to home. The U.S. fatalities in the Civil War, Korea War, and World War II. How many men died in the American Civil War? Some very fine government historians at the end of the war, on in the 1880s, tried to go into the accounts of the various battles and the, the action reports and the number of wounded and the number of people buried, and try to come up with an authoritative number, of the actual number of men who were killed in the war. And we usually say it's about 620,000. Whoa! A nation of 31 million people, 620,000 dead. Is that accurate? More recently, a historian came forward and said, looking at the censuses, remember, censuses in the United States aren't always completely accurate. So he speaks in broad terms, but he compares like the 1860 census with the 1870 census. And he says a more reasonable estimate on the number of people that died during the war would be like 750,000 to like 850,000. Now, I'm not looking at political motives when we talk about the Civil War. But can we say, viewing on the kind of information that is available, the numbers can be questioned. I have a strong interest in World War I, and I have other interests in other wars as well trying to understand. One of my interests has been the Korean War. Now, back in the day, decades ago, I'd actually get bibliographies and try to read every book on the bibliography of the Korean War. That was a lot easier to do 40, 50 years ago than it is now because the bibliography is so much larger. So don't be impressed with a large number with, the, with the, the reading bibliographies. But I did try to come to a good handle of what it was like and what happened there. For many years, they were saying 37,000 U.S. troops were killed in the Korean War. And I was pretty happy with that. It seemed pretty reasonable to me. <clears throat> More recently, in the last few decades, they built a couple of war monuments in the mall in downtown Washington, D.C., the most famous of which is the Vietnam War Memorial, also known as the Wall. And it has the names of over... To give you an image here of the Korean War Memorial. It's a different effect, and I apologize because this is kind of intruding on our visual space, but as long as I can show you what I'm talking about. Uh, the Korean War Memorial is, is it, Vietnam War Memorial is very, very impressive. It's very large and big black granite, and it's got the names of all the people who died that we know of who died during during the war. Well, the Vietnam, excuse me, the Korean War Memorial, you can see it from above over here. The Korean War Memorial has a wall. It doesn't have names on it, but it has faces. 
that are etched into the granite with people looking out at us. One of the things that I find I found very moving. These are li larger than life size figures, which have people wearing their ponchos as raining in Korea, marching. The slope goes up. To me, it's symbolic of marching up those god awful hills in Korea to go up and fight for pieces of real estate that doesn't mean a hill of beans as far as the war is concerned. Now, however, let's go back to my. They have a statement down here, which I think is very appropriate. The number of men involved, the number of men involved from the various nations and the number of casualties. And they said that the fatalities in Korea was 54,000 dead. Now, wait a minute, 74,000? See, I said that wrong. 37,000 goes up to 54,000. I'm going, <clears throat> okay. Well, now as I look around, <clears throat> Quite frankly, I was shocked by that. I thought I had a good handle. Now we, we look around at the casualty figures, depending on where you want to look. I do see, still see 37,000 in a few places, but I also see 54,000, which is correct. The one that, I, that has really gotten me is the number of fatalities suffered by the United States during World War II. Back early in college, way back in the day. They were saying about 190,000 U.S. American, Americans were killed. U.S. Americans redundant. Americans were killed in the Second World War. I never questioned that. But after a while, I saw like 220,000. After a while, I saw 330,000. Most recently, when you look up in recent almanacs, for example, they'll say like 410,000. In a museum in San Diego, is dealing with a traveling exhibit about the Soviets in the Second World War. And I don't know who the historians were, but they said that, oh, essentially, let's be honest, probably about 600,000 Americans died in the Second World War. <clears throat> I'm not sure if that's sustainable where they got that number. The one we see most often is 410,000. But see, it's changed over time. Now, I don't know who's making these decisions, but I'm going to speculate as to perhaps why they made the decisions. You see, at the end of the Second World War, the United States decides to not retreat to isolationism. The United States had never kept a large permanent military institution. In fact, what they had done yeah, we got a lot of guys together during the Civil War, a lot of men fighting the American Revolution, very, very large numbers, large casualties. When it's over, all you need is enough to chase Indians or to push the Indians back. So what do you need a big military for? However, if the United States wants to have a very large military presence, become a very important power during the Cold War at the end of the Second World War, we do want to have the will of the American people. You do this in more than one way. You can get the scare in the American people. All the Soviets are going to come and get us. That's involved. But how about downplaying the actual cost of the Second World War? Yeah, we, yeah, we can afford a military establishment. It, yeah, of course men die. A lot of men die. But, but the numbers aren't as alarming. But later on, they do go up when Americans are, get, are used to our permanent military establishment. Can we say that sometimes these are politically motivated? Let's look at the U.S. fatalities in the First World War. <clears throat> Which book do you want to read? The United States is only heavily involved in the last few months of the war. That gives enough time to lose a lot of men. We'll talk later about U.S. involvement and casualties, that kind of thing. We do read that 57, 50, I said that wrong, that 56,000 men were killed as U.S. forces in the First World War. However, other books will say we'll double that, literally, and take out to 112,000 men. You go, I probably should have erased this number over here. I saw this in a five volume. Encyclopedia of World War I. I was trying to look around to see if 
the various no numerical estimates I had seen before had actually were actually correct. <clears throat> so I looked here, and I I swear I read this several times. Like rereading it, it's saying two hundred thirteen thousand dead. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's it's got to be a typo. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. But you do see that there is a difference in numbers. One historian said, oh, of course, we're going to have different numbers coming out because there's different ways of calculating fatalities. I go, well, would you tell me what it is? He said there was, so I wish he had told me. I'd like to, I'd like to be able to bring that more firmly to the discussion. Let's take a look at this a little bit more, however. Uh, sometimes, now, something that I don't usually talk about in a class like this are the large number of men who died because of the influenza pandemic of 1918-1919. Some nations will say, well, they died of disease, they didn't die of combat, therefore we'll leave them off, off the list. Uh, there's an issue of killed, wounded, and missing. What, what that missing category? Uh, can they show up as prisoners? Can they show up as dead? You see, there can be there can be a certain amount of flux in how you do this. But let's talk, take a look at raw numbers. The overall fatalities conservatively. By conservatively, conservatively, I mean, as we look at what the various nations have said, these are the actual losses that they officially say. And we add, add up 8.5 million men. Some historians say 9 million. That's what the governments say. But once again, how did you calculate this? We often exclude the missing. What happened to those guys? Were they prisoners? They're going to show up later? Going to find them a shell hole later on? We don't know. Should we include them? Should we exclude them? Becomes an interesting question. Disease. People want to say, well, you died of the flu, you didn't die of the war. Well, Going back to the Civil War, for example, you're talking 620,000 men dead. About two-thirds of those, about 400,000, therefore, actually died of disease. Therefore, only about 200,000 died of the effects of combat. You see, if this is the case, then we're not being quite consistent in how we view, view the number of casualties. Of course, there's more, more involved than just... men in the military. An estimate. We don't have a good count of this. The largest fatalities, the largest death rates of civilians during the war is essentially on the Eastern Front. So a lot more movement going on. The Western Front, the Italian Front, the Balkans Front tend to be more static. But the Eastern Front tends to move more dramatically. When you do so, you sweep across civilian populations. Disruptions, displacements, taking food resources, end up with more problems with hygiene and disease. Then we can say six million people die. Whoa, it's getting large. This is just an estimate. Now, I'm old school. Yeah, I do the adding up. It's about 15 million total. Very large death rates. Other estimates. See where I'm at time-wise. I'm getting down. I'm running out of time for an hour and 15-minute lecture. Let me just say this. I'm old school. That when I was first reading back in junior high school over 50 years ago, when I was first reading about the First World War in any real sense, uh, they were saying 11 million men. The argument was this. Well, the government say we lost eight and a half million men, but we're burying a lot more, more millions more bodies. So let me leave it right here because I have a lot more to say about casualties. However, this is lecture number one, and I will resume this discussion when we go into lecture number two. In the meantime, wherever you're doing, enjoy, and come back, and we'll continue our discussion.